Hello, ladies and gentlemen, all you truth seekers out there. Thank you so much for joining me. This is Project Truth Beam, and this lesson is going to be on what the Bible says about your health and the body. And uh, this is such an important time to be talking about this because of, you know, us being in this quote unquote situation on the earth. All right. So the body is an amazing thing that we have been given by God. It has an estimated 37 trillion cells. There are 78 organs, 206 bones for the adults, it's over 300 for children. Bones are four times stronger than concrete. The, there are... Uh, 45 miles of nerves in the human body. Our hearts pump 2,000 gallons of blood each day. We are made up of 60 to 70% water, and that just depends on the person as to how hydrated you are. Uh, we also regenerate and repair. It's truly amazing that we can do something like that. The skin it repairs and replenishes every 28 days. Blood repairs and replenishes 120 days. Bones, 8 to 11 months. Joints, 11 months. And it is a miracle that we can do something like that. God has built in us a healing mechanism. And you need to be healthy so that you can access this healing mechanism. And how do you do that? Well, you keep your body healthy and the things that go into it. Your body is a machine. It is a manufacturing plant to uh, run and create energy. And for that manufacturing plant, you need to give it the correct raw materials to run properly. And these raw materials that the human body needs is oxygen, water, minerals, vitamins, essential fatty acids, that's types of oils, omega-3, 6, and 9, amino acids as proteins. Your body needs gut bacteria. And I also throw in detox. Your body needs to detox, which is what the liver does, but the human body needs to flush out toxins. And it does flush out toxins. The body also needs to interact with viruses and bacteria so that it can form an immune system. If you hide from these, you never interact with them. You will not have an immune system, and therefore the body is at risk of dying. The body also needs sunlight, needs sleep to recharge, needs exercise, laughter, love, and most important, the body needs purpose. Every Every human needs purpose in life. Otherwise, they just shrivel up and they are depressed. And depression and stress lowers the immune system quite drastically. I was told from a study that your immune system drops 30% just from mental stress. So let's get into the Bible and what we find there about the body and health and sicknesses and all kinds of stuff like that. We're going to start with the book of Genesis, back with Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve, they're the first two created. By the way, we've done DNA mapping of the genome of humans, and they have found that we all go back to one common female. So that is further proof, science proof, that we go back to Eve. Also, the, if it goes back to a woman, well, there has to be a man to create the first child. It can't just be a single woman by herself. It has to be a man and a woman. This is the same dilemma that the uh, uh, evolutionary or evolutionists all say, oh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it's impossible. That's an imp impossible situation. You have to have a rooster and a chicken to make the first fertilized egg. You have to have half of the chromosomes from the male, half the chromosomes from the female to ever get the first created 
baby. So there is no which came first, the chicken or the egg. That situation has been solved. It's in Genesis where God created male and female. And it's really cool because science is always proving the Bible correct. You look at Adam and Eve. When, when God created Adam, he made him out of the likeness of, of God. And then he breathed in the breath of life to Adam. And the body plus the breath of life, which came from God, he provided it. That creates a living soul. You have to have the flesh and the breath of life given by God to create a soul, a being. And so the breath of life goes back to God. So you have to have both to be alive. You have to have both to be a living being, a soul. So all these animals out here have the breath of life. They have flesh and they have the breath of life. So they also have souls as well. That's what uh, is according to the scriptures and how you read it, especially in the Hebrew. It's very obvious. When it gets to um, Eve, God says Adam can't be alone. He has to have a companion. And so he takes the rib from Adam. He puts him under uh, sleep. And this is the first surgery ever recorded. God removed the rib, and he took that rib and created a woman. Woe man means from man, came from the side of man. And like I said, science is proving the Bible correct each day. But again, they don't post it in the news, so it's kind of hard to find out these things. But there is a bone in the human body that you can remove, and it will grow back. There's only one bone that does that in the body, and that is the very last rib on your rib cage. You can take it off, and it happens a lot in accidents, like car accidents. People will break that bone, and it grows back, and that's because God already planned that ahead of time, and he removed it from Adam, and so it grew back. So that is amazing. And let's continue. Let's look at Genesis 6. Now, this is a uh, a slightly controversial uh, topic, but I did want to include this in here because it is worth noting. Uh, Gen 6 is um, a chapter where it talks about the fallen angels try to corrupt the DNA of the people prior to the flood and they were mating with the daughters of men and God was not pleased with this and you could read it as if they were producing giants or mighty men the word is Nephilim Um, you can legitimately translate it either way however um, I lean towards giants but the, the point of the story was Satan was trying to corrupt the DNA to prevent uh, a lineage so that the Messiah could come, so that Jesus could come into the world. And God saw that Noah and his family were still righteous and they were not corrupted. And so He wiped out the whole entire world, saving these eight people in a boat. By the way, that story exists on every continent in every culture around the world. It predates uh, the written scriptures of the Bible, the Noah's Ark global flood, saving all the animals. I think there's about 300 cultures that have recorded that very same story. But I digress. So uh, God himself was not pleased at us modifying or manipulating our DNA. And I can completely understand that because we uh, were created by him and we were made perfect in his eyes. And so why would you want to tinker and change 
DNA, which is the signature on every living being on this planet of God. That's his signature. That's his stamp of approval or his markings, his DNA. And so I think a lot of people need to be asking themselves if it is a problem here in the near future for us to be modifying our DNA. Is it a moral issue? You know, what are the ramifications spiritually? And also, what are the ramifications physically, scientifically? Because people are editing their genes. They, you can buy CRISPR online now, and they are tinkering with themselves. You can go in and get procedures done to tinker with your genes and mess with your DNA. It's called gene editing. And uh, there's even some new uh, jabby jab shots in the arm that modify your DNA directly and indirectly. And, you know, we need to be asking ourselves, is this safe? Is this healthy? What are the side effects later down the line? You're messing with something that is very important. Your DNA is very important to your human body. It tells the body a lot of information and a lot of things to do. So I thought I'd mention that the Bible does tackle Gen 6, and uh, it didn't look like God was pleased with that. Let's talk about the book of Job. Now, in Job, Satan goes to God and, and uh, says, I want to mess with Job. And uh, one thing that you see is that God has a net of protection over Job. And uh, Satan was like, well, I can't touch him. I can't mess with him. You have a net of protection because he has such a relationship with, with uh, God. And uh, I think this is important to know that humans can have this net of protection. God can protect you. He can keep you from the evil one who wants to destroy your life and send diseases and pestilence at you. We look at Job, how Satan struck him with sores from his head to his toes. And that was because Job was being tested. God pulled back that net of protection, and then Satan came in to do his dirty work. Do the dirty work. And so I think that this is important, that we are to get right with God, to have a, a tight relationship with him so that we can be in sh uh, certain that we have this net of protection. We, if we live a, a, a displeasing life to God, how can we um, be certain that we are going to be pr protected from these plagues? Let's briefly talk about clean and unclean animals. This is, this is uh, something that's kind of controversial to mainstream Christianity. Um, if you, you know, think, well, uh, you know, clean and unclean animals, that's not a big deal. Well, God outlined what was clean and unclean at the beginning of creation. He made the animals clean and unclean. And by clean and unclean, he defines what is good for food. He tells us what is good for food. And there shouldn't be any debate on this. God said these animals are good to eat and these are not good to eat. And he divides them with clean and unclean. And really all clean is means that these animals, and this is a simple way to think about it, is these animals are grazers. They eat clean stuff. They eat grass. They eat hay. They don't eat things that are going to be bad for them and bad for you if you eat that animal. And then the unclean animals are like the prey, uh, the predator uh, animals and the, the scavenger am animals. And so those animals will eat carcasses, like vultures, they eat dead carcasses, possums, raccoons. They eat up the leftover dead remains of other animals. And the uh, predators, they attack and kill animals. And so we need those animals in the environment. You know, this is the ultimate environmentalism, is that we keep these 
these animals that go around cleaning up the environment, you know, like shrimp, they clean up the bottom of the seafloor and they clean up the estuaries. And if we eat up all those cleaners, then we don't have anything to be around to suck up the toxins. And all of a sudden your environment is going to be very toxic and full of mercury and pesticides and all those other you know, garbage out there. There's nothing to clean it. And so this is the ultimate environmentalism. God has already solved these problems. Why are we reversing it? And so when we eat these unclean animals, the toxins are passed on to us. You know, the pig, it does not sweat. And so when it eats up toxins, it gets stored in its fat cells. And then when you cook it and eat it, there is a reason why you are getting high blood pressure and cholesterol problems. It's because you are consuming the carcinogens that are released in the fat tissue and the oils when you cook it. You know, God has already figured all this out. And if we just eat his diet, we won't suffer these diseases of the wicked. Anyways, let me continue. So looking forward in history, uh, or sorry, looking back in history, we have people being struck with, with illnesses and, and situations. So Paul, he was struck blind. Herod, he was struck down by the angel of the Lord and then eaten up with worms till he died. Nebuchadnezzar, he was struck with a mental illness. These are people being struck with things. And um, they were not doing right. Paul was crucifying God's people. Herod, he was being an evil little you know, tyrant. And Nebuchadnezzar was also doing bad things in Avalon. And they, they were struck with things. So this is, you know, sometimes... You know, God can do stuff like this to people. But the Bible also says that sometimes good things happen to bad people and sometimes bad things happen to good people. So not everything is under the purpose of God. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes it comes from Satan. And a lot of people want to blame God for everything. You know, anything that happens wrong, I just want to blame God. Well, wait a second. You know, why aren't you blaming Satan for something? Why aren't you blaming the fall of Adam and Eve? Why aren't you blaming sin? You know, why are you just blaming God? You just want to be anti-God. I just don't understand that. Let's look at the three plagues of the Old Testament. So we have Kor's rebellion. That was people trying to rebel, and a plague went through and wiped them out. It was 14 1,700 died from that rebellion. So, uh, you know, got here in this, in this situation, they were doing wrong, and God sent a plague through there. The next one was from worshiping Baal Peor, and 24,000 people died in that plague. Worshiping a false god, and God was not pleased. The next one was David did a census. He was told not to count and not to do a census. And he, and he suffered another plague, and that one was 70,000 died in that plague. And so I think it's important that, you know, when these plagues pop out, which they do in modern history, you don't necessarily need to find out the exact moment and location that it pops up and, you know, starts spreading. But you also, you, you really need to ask yourself is, are we worthy of this plague? Have we been doing wicked things in our nation? Have we been doing wicked things around the world to displease God? Perhaps God lifted a protection over us and allowed a plague to come through. You know, that is a question that we should be asking. And here it, it says in Exodus 23, 25, so you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. And notice this, it's very important. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. 
No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. So if we serve the Lord our God, he will bless our food, he will bless our water, and he will take away our sickness and we won't be sick and we won't have unhealthy people in our land. So what is the answer when we actually have a plague? Turn to God. He will remove it. That is the answer. You know, the Bible has a very distinct protocol on what do you do with sick people? What do you do with people with skin diseases and other types of viruses and diseases? You isolate those who are sick. Everyone else is to remain you know, safe and calm and, and carrying on working and everything. And everybody should be consulting God and serving God. And then people will go and check on the sick to make sure they're fine and to give them food and water and also pray for them. So that is the Bible's protocol. I don't know why we're not following the Bible's protocol. We need to be going to God and fixing all of these issues that might be causing our, our situation. Now, let's get into the body. Jeremiah 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a, a prophet to the nations. This is talking about Jeremiah. And notice he knew him before he formed him in the womb. So, you know, this situation of, uh, you know, life, life is, is in the womb. And, and God even knows before he forms you in the womb. He knows you. And so um, that is a very important thing to point out when it comes to the body. Psalms 139, verse 13 and 14. For you created in my midst being, innermost being, I'm sorry. For you created in my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you before. I praise you because I am fearful and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And this is David talking. He's saying, you knitted to me, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. And so God's doing the creating. He's creating the body. That is where the body was created by God in the womb. First Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So our bodies are temples. What is a temple? It is a place to, to uh, go to and worship God and to have the light of the world in it, the, the menorah, to have the bread, the wine, and to um, pray and to be holy and clean. You're supposed to have a clean temple. And that is where God will be housed. God will have his glory in there in the holiest of holies and that should be our hearts our innermost being should be a place where god lives and um you know are we to you know destroy our temples right just just treat it like it's you know some abandoned building and, and spray gra graffiti all over it and to you know not take care of it when it is falling and dilapidated the roof's falling in and bricks are falling off is that respectful you know if if god's saying that our bodies are not our own that they're his and he has given them given these bodies to us to experience this world and to um, house his holy spirit to do his work inside of us 
than we are to respect that and to treat it properly. You know, it goes back to our, our manufacturing. You know, are you treating your body with respect that you're giving it all the water and the minerals and vitamins and all the other things that go along with it? The body, Romans 8, 10 through 11. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who has raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He will give you everlasting life through your, your, inc- your corruptible bodies. He will put in his spirit that dwells in you. And later you will get incorruptible bodies. In the kingdom, you will get new bodies of flesh that are glorified. So again, this is, this is uh, you know, saying that your bodies are sinful but everything can change when God puts his spirit in you and dwells in you. So your bodies are vessels. Romans 12, 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So even though we have our one single body, which are uh, vessels to hold the Holy Spirit, we are also connected. We're connected to a one bigger body, and that is all the followers of Christ, all those who are in covenant with God and are living righteously and following you know, what God has said to do. Those people are part of our body we are all together connected so there is our physical body and then a bigger body a body of believers and you know we can be a foot and we're just as important as the one that's the hand or the heel and the just don't be the armpit you know i just say that's not a place to be but it's important we need an armpit everybody needs an armpit (laughs) Moving on, so 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wraith, but we and uh, imperishable. Therefore, I I run, this is Paul speaking, I run in such a way as not without aim, so he runs with purpose, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but... I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So we are supposed to discipline our bodies, to exercise our bodies, to be at our top uh, physical shape so that we can go and run a race, do a task that God has called us to do it is responsible for us to be in good health so that we can go on and do god's will how are you going to get out and preach god's word to the unbeliever if you are extremely overweight and are tired all the time and have brain fog because you don't eat healthy you know how are you going to do the best job that you can do it's going to be difficult So you need to motivate yourself for God to get in shape for the race. 
Do not be afraid. I want to encourage you. Do not be afraid. Proverbs 17, verse 22. And this is for all those that are afraid of our situation and afraid of you know the diseases out there. Proverbs, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit drives up the bones. And this is so true because they, like I said earlier, you know, when you have mental stress, the immune system drops 30%. And so you can ask doctors and nurses, you know, when, when there is a support group, when there are more people coming in and loving on those people that are in the hospital with these diseases, they will heal faster when they are happy and they're receiving love. And they heal slower when nobody comes and visits them. So get out and visit the sick. Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid for those who kill the body cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell and the grave. And so that is another point. Everybody wants to run around being afraid, being afraid. Ah, you know, God has not given you a spirit of fear. You're not supposed to be afraid. The enemy wants you to be afraid. Satan wants you to live in fear. He, you know what? When you get everybody stirred up in fear, people make bad decisions. People do bad things. People are easily manipulated when they are afraid. Be afraid of the boogeyman outside of camp. You know, they can use that against you. And so we're not supposed to be afraid. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be powerful priests and kings on this earth. We're supposed to be in charge. And God does not want us to be afraid because, uh, you know, Satan is the one that wants us to be afraid. And he can manipulate us. And it's saying here, You got the wrong priorities. Don't be afraid of death. You need to be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body. And that's the Almighty. The Bible says, first, seek the kingdom of God. You're supposed to seek God's face and have righteous fear. You fear the wrath of God. You fear disappointing God. You fear disappointing the Father in heaven. That's the type of fear you need to have. You don't need to be afraid of this world. This world is only a test, the testing ground for the next. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body is to be thrown in hell. And that place is Gehenna. That's also the fire. And so I put this in here because it's important to say this is an allegory. This is a metaphor, metaphorical speech uh, talking about if something is in your life that is messing you up, it's causing you to stumble, is causing you to break with your relationship with God. If you are an alcoholic and you do a bunch of wicked stuff every time you get drunk, you need to cut it off, get rid of it, throw it out of your life. If you are, you know, doing drugs, and it messes up your life, messes up your relationship, cut it out, get it out of your life because you don't need it. Anything that disrupts your relationship with God, you need to remove it. It is bad for you, and it is going to cause you to fall away more. Let's look at the leaders at the top, you know, the people that are telling us what to do, you know, the doctors, the politicians, the priests and kings, the the presidents, the White House staff, all these people at the top, you know, they they have our best interests, you know, the the news, they have our best interest. No, no, they don't. And they're fooling us. They, They exist to fool us. And Jeremiah 17, verse 9 through 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search in the heart, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to 
their conduct according to what their deeds deserve. So in the hearts of all people are wicked, evil hearts. God will see the heart. He knows what you're thinking. Mark 10, 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. And so we're not to be calling, well, this person's good, you know. Oh, you know, I trust this this guy because, you know, he's good. Or I hear a lot of times people saying that, uh, well, I'm a good person. Well, the Bible says no one is good. So, uh, no, <laughs> no, you're not good. No, not one is good. Psalms 146, verse 3. Do not put your trust in. And princes, that being like governors and leaders, princes, uh, nor in a son of man, that's just a, a leader, in whom there is no help. They can't help you. You need to put your faith and trust in God Almighty. He can help you. Relying on all these other people, you know, oh, well, I'll just follow them and, and do what they say. They have my my health in their hands and i trust them that's irresponsible first corinthians 2 5 that your faith shall be shall should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of god so you're not to put your faith in some smart guy because he says he's smart you put your faith in god God will talk to you. God will do things for you. He'll move things around. And, you know, people will say, well, I, I, you know, he's smart. He knows all this. Yeah, yeah, he's powerful. And how do you think he got up to that powerful position? Probably stepped over a lot of bodies. He probably did a lot of wicked things and made a lot of wicked friends. Because at the top is a bunch of wicked people. Colossians 2. Verse 8, see, it, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on, on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. That is very big today. Everyone wants to, everyone wants to say, well, we can trust these experts, the experts, you know, these people who, who have figured out this is a, this philosophy or, or this is how we're supposed to fix our situation. I've come up with uh, people, but, oh, let's just, let's trust them. Let's just do everything they say. Well, rather than trusting Christ and, see, and going to the Bible to see what we're supposed to do, what is the protocol that God has said? that we need to do for this situation. But no, for some reason, the world wants to do the opposite. They want to turn to man. And man is wicked. Leviticus 19, verse 28. You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourself. I am the Lord. Now, I put this one in because I wanted to talk about your body. So there's a lot of people out there in mainstream Christianity. They want to dog on tattoos and they want to say, oh, you get a tattoo. That's a sin. That's evil. That's not what the Bible's saying. What this is saying in context is it was a Canaanite ritual that God was telling them not to do. These people would take and they would cut their flesh. They would cut certain parts lines and and little circles and they would shave their head and they would pull out their beards and pull out the corners of their beards in mourning and and they would take um, charcoal and they would poke charcoal into their skin as a mourning and a reminder and and uh, for the dead loved ones that have passed and so God was saying in other verses not to worship the dead. They are dead in the grave and they know nothing. And so we're not to be doing that. We're not to get tattoos 
for dead people. And, you know, how many people get tattoos for dead people? Well, it's probably about half. But if you don't, if you don't get it for the purpose of a dead person, then it's not a sin. It's not a problem. You can get a tattoo as long as it's not for the dead. You know, you can get tigers and lions and, you know, all kinds of, you know, stuff on there. You know, that's not for the dead. And that's the purpose of that verse is to say, hey, don't be worshiping the dead. Don't be doing the Canaanite rituals that they do in the other lands, the pagans do. Stay away from those rituals. God will protect you. He will protect your body. Let's look at Deuteronomy. Chapter 7, verse 12 to 15. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, these laws being his instructions, the Torah, the things that he has said for us to do, like the Ten Commandments, and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his commandments, or keep his covenant, sorry, he will keep his covenant of love with you. That's what his, his covenant is, is because he loves us. Going on, as he swore to your ancestors, he will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb. Talking about the female womb. This is the body. The crops of your land will be blessed. Your grain, new wine, and olive oil. The calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. You will be blessed more than any other people. This is a covenant with Israel. None of your men or women will be childless, nor any of your livestock be without young. He's going to bless the, the reproduction of the people and the animals in the land. No miscarriages. You will have babies. The Lord will, this is the most important part, the Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all who hate you. So, if we want to be free of every disease, this is what the Bible says, and I believe it. If you want to be free of every disease, you are to get in line with God, keep his commandments, love him, and he will cast his net of protection over you like he did with Job, and he will bless you. He will keep the diseases from you. He will put up walls and barriers, and it won't touch you. He will not inflict any horrible diseases on you, and he will inflict the horrible diseases on your enemies, the ones who hate you, the ones who are plotting against you. They will be struck. And so, really, we need to get in line with God. Perhaps why we see all these diseases swiping across the nation is because they are not in line with God. You know, we need to ask ourselves this. I'm not condemning everyone and saying that that is that, but we need to be asking those questions. We need to be turning to God for help. Jeremiah 33, verse 6. Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. God is the great healer. Exodus 15, verse 26. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right in my eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So, you know, he brought diseases and pestilence and boils to the Egyptians. You know, they were you know, worshiping other gods. They were doing wicked things. And if we 
If we follow God's commandments and we turn to him, he will protect us and heal us. Skin disorders. I have to talk about skin disorders. On the English Bible, it translates it as leprosy. Leprosy doesn't show up till well after Jesus, like 600 years after Jesus. It's not a disease of the ancient times. And leprosy, uh, that word in Hebrew is skin disorder. So it's some sort of rash, perhaps psoriasis, some kind, sort of nasty skin disease that was popping up. And it was because of sin. Let's look at Luke 5, verse 12 through 15. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered in the skin disorder. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You know, because they considered you unclean because you had a disease. You couldn't go to the temple and make sacrifice to God. You couldn't make the animals, uh, give animals. You couldn't pay them. You couldn't even be up there because you were unclean. You had to wait until your disease was gone for you to be clean. Then you could go make your animal sacrifices. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, which was shocking to everyone because Jesus would become unclean at that moment when he touched an unclean person. And most people were afraid of lepers, or not lepers, but skin disorders, because they were afraid it could get passed on to them. And nobody touched those people, and Jesus touched them. I am willing, he said, Cl be clean. And immediately the skin disorder left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for you, cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that the crowds of the people came to hear him and, be, and to be healed for their sicknesses. So Jesus was telling him the proper procedure healed them and he told them you go visit the priest because that's the next step the priest is supposed to come look at you and to see and verify that you are clean that you don't have the disease anymore and then you are to go dip in the water and then you can go enter into the temple area and present your animal sacrifices let's look at the woman with the blood issue with the bleeding issue this is this is saying that you know jesus can heal you you know he was the the uh, the vessel which god healed people and if you notice that god or uh, jesus would tell them god has healed you now repent and sin no more let's look at luke 8 verse 43 through 48. Now a woman having a flow of blood, I mean, she was bleeding constantly for 12 years. So uh, bleeding is, is, not, is, is unclean. So you can't go up to the temple if you're bleeding. It's not really a sin, but it's an unclean issue. So you can't go do the proper worship to God by offering animal sacrifices, which is unfortunate. Continuing, who this woman had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. So she was going to these herbal people and all these healers and in that time. It really wasn't a doctor, doctor. That's a modern thing. But these people who, who were, would facilitate healing, they could not help her for 12 years came from behind and touched the border of his garment. So she reached out and touched his garment. And immediately her flow stopped. 
And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And, and you say, who touched me? So all these people were touching him. And he's saying, what are you talking about? Everybody's touching me. But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. So he accidentally healed this woman, and he could feel it. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him. She felt guilty and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. And so one thing I want to point out here is this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. In the Old Testament, it says that the Messiah would have healing in his wings. And in that, in the Hebrew word for that, it's related to tzitzit, which is a tassel, the tips of his tallit. And so when she reached out and touched him, she was grabbing onto his tassel that represents God. That's what the tassels mean. They represent God. And so she reached up and grabbed his tassel, which the Bible says the Messiah will have healing in his tassels. So that was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Let's look at encouragement. Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So we are supposed to be strong and courageous in everything. And do not be afraid because God's with you. He's on your side. When people are panicking, oh, these diseases, oh, this, it's happening. We need to be courageous and strong and know that God is still on his throne. He's still sovereign. Psalms 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkness valley, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that rod is a metal rod that you use for punishment, for hitting things like, you know, you know, lions and bears and stuff. You have a, an iron rod. It's the wrath. And then your staff is for rescuing. This is, this is a, a shepherd thing. So his staff is to rescue you and save you and pull you away from, you know, cliffs and rocks and, and to, you know, guide you and to count you. They would have them walk underneath the staff and they would count them with little taps and say, one, two, three, four, five. I have all five of my sheep. And so we are to not fear any evil because God is with us, even in the dark times, even during a global pl plague. Psalms 91. This is such an amazing chapter i encourage everybody to read psalms 91 whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of almighty i will say of the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my god in whom i trust surely he will save you from the fowler's snares and from the deadly pestilence. God will save us from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers under and under his wings. You will find refuge. He will shelter us. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks outside in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. 
God will protect us. Further, more encouraging verses. 2 Corinthians 1.10 And he did rescue us from mortal danger, mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. Second Thessalonians 3.3 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. We need to pray for protection. And finally, I want to leave with you the analogy of the gift giver and the gift. God has given us this wonderful gift of a body, our biomechanical flesh bag, whatever you want to call it, that's held up with bones. He has given us this temple and vessel to go around and experience this wonderful creation that he has given us. He has blessed us with this body to do his will and to choose him and to have a relationship with him. He has given us a gift. And when you receive a gift, it is important to cherish the gift because the way that you view the gift and how you treat the gift is a reflection of how you view and treat the gift giver. If you are gifted something by somebody you don't like, you're going to just throw it to the side. You know, you're just going to be reckless with it. You know, tear it up. You know, that happens very often. You you get a new gift and you just ride it hard and you know throw it around because you didn't work hard for it. It was given to you, and you didn't respect the person that gave it gave it to you but if you respect the, and love the person who gave it to you gave you this gift then you're going to cherish it you're going to put that gift in a nice little box you're going to um, you know watch out for it you're going to put it in a nice safe area you're going to tell everybody about this gift that was given to you and the person who gave it to you you know we've been given this body and praise God that he has chose us and given us this body and that it runs so well and that it does so much that we can go around and have laughter and joy and peace and love and, and, and to experience a relationship with God and to experience a relationship with everyone else around us. We're not alone. We have neighbors. We have friends. And we are to treat them with love and kindness. And so, you know, don't forget about the gift giver. Don't forget about God and what he has given you. We need to praise the gift giver. And that's what I want to leave you with. So I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Project Truth Beam. We love all of our comments on our comment section when people post things. Please don't hesitate to do that. We read all of them. And if you have any suggestions, any things that you would like to see on here, any, any uh, you know, things to research, please leave it in there. We really appreciate that. And, you know, give this a thumbs up and share it out to all your friends. People need to know uh, what the Bible says about the body and your health and what we are to do. And so, Thank you so much for joining me and God bless you.